recognizes the original inhabitants of these lands and recognizes that they still reside throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area. And we recognize the impact of their wisdom and generosity towards us. If you've flown into the valley, you have undoubtedly seen the Salt River Project canals that surround the area. Those modern day canals follow the framework of the canals originally constructed by ancestral Sonoran desert people who will come to make this area both livable and a place where peoples could thrive. We acknowledge that the modern day indigenous nations that descended from the ancestral peoples are the original inhabitants of this land. Good afternoon and welcome. We are honored to welcome Gail King to the Cronkite School today as the 39th Cronkite Award honoree. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to those who have traveled with Gail from New York and have joined us for this afternoon's event. We have with us today from CBS Wendy McMahon, who is president and co-head of CBS News and CBS television stations. And also tomorrow we will be joined by George Cheeks, who is the president and CEO of CBS Entertainment. And now I am excited to introduce your co-hosts, Alexia Stanbridge and Valeria Rodriguez. A little bit about these students. Alexia Stanbridge will graduate in May with a master's degree in mass communications from the Cronkite School. Alexia has spent time reporting for Cronkite News in Washington, D.C. and in Phoenix. She has also interned and worked as a student producer for Arizona Horizon, Break It Down, and Black in Arizona on Arizona PBS. Following graduation, Alexia plans to join a television station as a multimedia journalist. Valeria Rodriguez is currently pursuing her master's degree in mass communication and will be graduating also in May. Valeria is a broadcast reporter for Cronkite News and a student worker for Arizona PBS. She is originally from El Paso, Texas. Thank you, Alexia and Valeria, for, for co-hosting today's conversation with Gail King and your fellow Cronkite students. And now, with no further ado, Ms. Gail King. With no further ado, hello, Cronkite Nation. Hello. I know, I just learned this. <laughs> Do you guys know what this means? Forks up. I just learned it. Hello, Valeria. Hello, Alexia. Hello, we just met earlier, and thank you so much, Dean We were Dean in the Bass. green room. Yes. We were in the green room. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much, Dean Batts, for the introduction. And thank you guys so much for being here today with us to be able to talk to the wonderful Gail King. Um, so just another round of applause for her. <laughs> another round of applause, it's funny. 
Um, Gail King is co-host of Emmy-winning CBS Mornings, an accomplished television journalist. King interviews top newsmakers and delivers original reporting to CBS Mornings and all CBS News broadcasts and platforms. Mm -hmm. She's also editor-at-large of Oprah Daily and hosts a live weekly radio show titled Gail King in the House mm -hmm. on Sirius XM. Yep. Since joining CBS News in 2011, King has conducted revealing and newsmaking interviews with world leaders, political figures, professional athletes, and celebrities. She has also handled many high-profile assignments like co-anchoring CBS News election night coverage 2022. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prior to her current role, King has hosted The Gail King Show, a live weekday television interview program on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Before that, she worked for 18 years as a television anchor for CBS affiliate WFSB in Hartford, Hartford, Connecticut. Prior to joining WSFB, King worked at a television stations in Kansas City, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. King has received numerous awards for her extensive work in, as a journalist including three Emmys. In 2018, she was inducted in the Broadcasting and Cable Hall of Fame in 2019. She was selected in the Time 100 Times Magazine annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Mm. So let's give another round of applause for Ms. Gail King again. Yeah. Right. Valeria, I want to meet her. She sounds like she does a lot of stuff. <laughs> and you do. And so we will, um, we're, we're going to ask a few questions start, to start off. And then after that, we'll open it up to the audience because oh, as great. you can tell, you're an amazing great, woman great. and I'm sure the audience has a lot to ask you. So we will get started. I'm still working on being an amazing woman. I'm still trying to do <laughs> that. You're an amazing <laughs> woman. Um, so just to start out, Tell us your reaction when you found out that you received the Walter Cronkite Award of Excellence in Journalism. It's the 39th one, and walk I us know. through that. I heard that. Number one, Alexia, when I heard it, it's very humbling just to have my name in the same sentence as Walter Cronkite, because he is a standard bearer for all of us in TV news. I said, you know, this is someone who was revered, and I'm so sorry, even though I'm at CBS, I never got a chance to meet him. But when you are starting out, Walter Cronkite is everything. And then I looked at the names of the people who have received the award, Diane Sawyer, who I know, or Scott Pelley, who I know from CBS, or Anderson Cooper, and I look at their body of work, and Robin Roberts, I went, wow. I couldn't believe that I was in the same class as everybody. So, of course, I was surprised, I was humbled, but more than anything, I feel proud and really honored. That's how I feel. And it is still starting to, to sink in. I, I, I was telling um, Yetta, who's, who works at your favorite station in Phoenix, I was telling Yetta that I was on the plane because this past weekend, guys, I was at NBA All-Star in Salt Lake City. I, was, I had some work to do out there. And flying from Salt Lake City to here to Phoenix, Charles Barkley was on the plane, who you guys know lives in Phoenix. And so he was saying, what do you, why are you on the plane? I said, oh, I'm getting a Walter Cronkite award. He goes, girl, that's a big deal. <laughs> and I go, I know, Charles, I know it's a big deal. And so I landed, and I'm still working on my speech for tomorrow, because I want to get it just right. So I feel, Alexia, this is a big deal, and, I, and I'm not taking it lightly. When you did, when you found out received the, oh, you received the award, walk us through that. Like, what were your thoughts? Where were you? Um, let's see, I think Sam Graham, t let's see, I got a letter that said they wanted to give it to me, and would I, would I accept it? And of course the answer was yes. And then it went from there, back in last year, to here I'm sitting here today. It's still, I'm still sort of, it really is still sinking in for me. It's well but deserved. It's really, it's really real, real being here in this building with you guys. Number one, I had no idea the building was so huge and ginormous. Honestly, I thought you all would have a wing. There would be a wing and maybe, because I've been places where they have a wing and they have a studio, and there's a couple of cameras, and you think, oh, this is really nice. But I walked in, and I went, whoa. This is a big deal, and this is big time. That's how I felt. Exactly. So throughout your journalism career, what has been the biggest challenges you faced as a journalist? 
Well, you know, I, I think it's getting, there's so much misinformation and disinformation out there. I've always said, and you've heard this phrase, everyone's entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own set of facts. And, you know, viewers have so many choices and options to choose from the news. And I, I just think you have to do your own due diligence because I see false information out there. You know, I was raised in a thing, tell the truth, just the facts, nothing but the facts, ma'am. And you can see how that is slipping away. So I think that is a big challenge. It's also a big challenge in keeping up with everything. You know, the news changes just like that instantly. So to be on top of it is, is a full-time, full-time job. And that is very challenging. You're absolutely I can go to the bathroom and come back and the news has changed. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I'm not in the bathroom very long. <laughs> I won't bore you with the details, but I'm not there very long. And you come back and they go, so and so and so just happened. And we are always ready for that. And um, Gail, you have had some of the most impressive, covered some of the most um, important events, and on top of that, had some of the biggest interviews, including with presidents. You've talked, you've gone on a ride along with Elon Musk. Yes. <laughs> and of yeah. course, your famous R. Kelly interview. Yes. Which of those moments, those interviews, were the most pivotal moments for you in your career? Well, for sure, it would have to be R. Kelly. I mean, that was pivotal on so many levels. That, when, when that happened, I'd had three different things, and I was trying to figure out what they were, honestly. I can't remember, but I'd had, I had three big interviews that week. And um, when you have three back-to-back, -back, I, I read an article once that said, you know, Gail King has gotten more scoops, has more scoops in Baskin and Robbins. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> I wasn't even trying. But I'd gotten interviews that just sort of fell in my lap in that way. But, R. Kelly certainly was a big game changer. And this is the thing that's so interesting about the news. More people saw the R. Kelly interview online than they did at watching the actual newscast. I mean, that still just blows me away because I grew up where you saw everything on television, you turned on your TV, there was the news, and now there are so many different sources and so many different ways to get the, to get the news. And so we have to meet people where they are, you know, whether it's digitally, whether it's streaming, whether it's uh, on broadcast. But clearly the R. Kelly interview certainly took me to a different level and people who may not have heard of me before certainly heard of me then. Absolutely. What was it and why? Why, why was that interview so important and pivotal for other people that, that don't know as much about it? Because he went to crazy town. I mean, <laughs> you know, and I, I, R. Kelly went from zero to 200 in a matter of seconds. And, and this is the thing, you know, I, I didn't really know R. Kelly and, and people said, you know, he became very heated during the interview. If you've seen it, he became extremely heated and extremely upset. And people said, Were you, weren't you afraid? I was honestly never afraid. Because at one point, he got up and he started hitting his fist. And he was hitting very hard. And I was worried that he might accidentally hit me. I didn't think that he was going to hit me or that he even wanted to hit me. I just thought that he might accidentally because he was so worked up. And I don't want to make light of Crazy Town because what I thought is that he was actually having a breakdown, to be honest with you. I thought it was the first time that he had really sat down and addressed the charges after that um, very damning documentary, Surviving R. Kelly, where several women had come forward and talked about his inappropriate behavior. I think those women were very believable and very credible. And I think he felt a lot of pressure because he still was maintaining and still does maintain his innocence. And so that was the first time. He knew we were going to talk about it, so it's not like he was blindsided. I never blindside or do a gotcha interview ever. So he knew we were going to talk about it. Um, and I think that he was just very triggered and very angry about it and became very emotional when he was talking. So that kind of blew up, as you all know. And then uh, the next day I called to check on him because I was sort of, is he okay? What is he thinking? And, and his team said that he actually wanted to thank me. I go, thank me? For what? I said, well, he said that you gave him the opportunity for people to see his passion and his pain. I'm like, is that what he saw in that interview? <laughs> oh, okay. I, I just was wondering how he was doing. So when you say what was a game changer for you, that was clearly it.
And I think people were surprised that I remained so calm during the interview. But I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid. And that was what I was just about to comment on, is when watching the interview, um, he, he obviously gets a little bit aggressive in it. Yeah. Um, and you just had this calm face. You were, so, you were so calm and classy during the whole thing. And I think that that's what us as journalists can get out of it, is how, is how calm you were and how you held yourself together. And that's what's impressive to us. Well, that's, why, that's when I think experience does pay off. Because <laughs> had that been my first interview, I would have totally freaked out. <laughs> I would have totally freaked out. But, mm -hmm. but I had watched uh, many interviews with him, and I had noticed that if he gets angry, he storms off. And so I knew, I'm, I'm sitting, if you guys see, I have my little cards in my thing, and I'm thinking, I'm not done with my interview yet, if there had been a thought bubble. Please don't walk off, please don't walk off. And I thought that if I had gone to say, wait, 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 or tried to restrain him and say, no, 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 calm down, I think that it would have been no, and he would have walked off. So I thought, if I just sit here calmly and let him do whatever he was doing, and I'm looking at him, looking at the chair, looking at him, looking at the chair, he, he, could, tell, he could tell that I wasn't going anywhere. And I think me, me being calm actually allowed him to be calmer, and he sat back down, and we finished, and we finished. But I didn't freak out. I didn't want him to think I was afraid. I didn't want to try to uh, deter him. I, just, I really just wanted him to sit back down so we could finish the interview. And that was for sure the right approach because you did get in to that particular that. case. Yeah, yes. it was. It was. So obviously, you've made it so far in your in your career as a journalist. Mm -hmm. If you were able to give your younger self a piece of advice, what would it be? Um, I would say, uh, always be prepared and don't be afraid to make mistakes, and don't think that. The problem is, though, guys, in this business, you can make a million mistakes. You don't want to be that guy. Yeah. But don't be afraid to make mistakes, because from your mistakes, you learn and you grow. And when you make a mistake, own up to the mistake, learn the lesson from it, and carry on. And so I've always been, you know, always been so afraid of making a mistake. I, you know, I was a girl, I, I don't want to make a mistake, but that's not realistic. Um, don't be afraid to take risk. I never take foolish risks or unnecessary risk. But I always am the type of person, I think it's OK to always bet on yourself. Always bet on yourself. I'm not saying you do something crazy, but if you are presented with something, and I never, I also think never pass up an opportunity. Never pass up an opportunity. But don't be afraid to take chances or make mistakes. Exactly. That can be, if you're afraid, that can be paralyzing, and you don't want to be paralyzed. Yeah, exactly. Especially and if you believe in yourself, Valeria. <laughs> exactly. You believe in yourself. Exactly. So out of all those uh, risks that you've taken, which of them has been the one that you are very proud of that you were maybe the most scared and you're like, I'm so glad I did this? Well, you know, I had a talk show um, back in the day. It was called The Gail King Show um, when I was anchoring the news in Hartford. I, like, like you said, I'd anchored the news in Hartford for 18 years. I love local news. I swear by local news. If you, can, if you can start out and get a job in local news, please do that. I think you learn so much in local news. But I was presented with this opportunity uh, to host a talk show called The Gail King Show. Um, and it didn't work out. And I debated if I was going to quit my job or do the show. And the theme song was, Gail's got something to talk about, something to talk about. And it was canceled. And Will, favorite son Will, who will be here tonight and tomorrow at the luncheon. He was six at the time. And, you know, I came home and I told him it had been can told the kids it had been canceled. And he goes, Gail's got nothing to talk about, nothing to talk about. And I go, well, mommy's not in the mood for that right now. <laughs> mommy's not in the mood. But even though it didn't work out, I was really glad that I did it. And I didn't, I, I wasn't, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. Because you know what? You're going to do stuff and it doesn't work out. And you get up, and as Jay-Z says, brush your shoulders off and keep going. And I was very glad that I kept my, own, I kept my other job, so I wasn't unemployed. But you know, not everything works out in life, and that's OK. I also believe that when you have a setback, you don't get the job you wanted. You might not get the partner you wanted or um, the promotion you wanted. I'm the type of person that believes everything happens for a reason. And I tell myself, something better is coming along. And in every instance in my life where, where there's been what I thought was so devastating and so upsetting and, oh, my God, how am I going to get through this, 
it, it, it ends up working out. And I think you should look at your own lives when you think, oh, that was terrible, that was crushing. And at the time, it may feel as such. But then when it all plays out, you think, OK, I'm still standing, and I'm OK. And now, um, where you are now with all these challenges, everything that you've gone through, but also all the success, what do you, what is your favorite thing about being a journalist? We talked earlier in the green room, and you were talking about how after the, oh, all my these crazy years, life. you yeah. love being a journalist I do. still. Um, tell us why. I still love this job. I still love this job. Look at what we get to do. <laughs> I was telling them guys in one week, I was at, in London for Queen Elizabeth's funeral, and I always say in this job, we have a front row seat to history. And I literally had a front row seat. We're on top of this balcony, and you, you see her cortege drive by, and we're literally, when I say front row seat to history, I mean we're literally there, and she is there. And with all the pomp and circumstance, I was blown away by all of that. I mean, I went from that for uh, on one day to later in the week they had asked me to introduce Harry Styles on at, on stage at Madison Square Garden. I love me some Harry Styles. That that <laughs> album Harry's House is really really good. My favorite song in the album Keep Driving. I love that song. Um, I go from that to and then at the end I think I was flying to do uh, Jennifer Hudson who was starting her show. I mean I had three like major things in one week. There's no I was friggin' tired at the end of the week. But there's no other job where you get to do that kind of thing. To me, even when there isn't a news day, I mean, look what happened just today, uh, breaking news with President Biden. Where did President Biden go, Valeria? There you go. And did people know about it, Alexia? No, they didn't. So the US government can keep a secret. Um, but but in, any, in any given day, the world is changing. And we get to be the ones that tell you that. That to me is such a high. Uh, you know, I, I don't do drugs, I don't drink. I got, I got drunk in high school. I was a leadership, I was a youth leader of the Christian Youth Leadership Conference, and I was one of the leaders. And somebody brought in a keg of beer, and I'd never had alcohol before, and I drank so much beer, and it made me so sick that I threw up, I had a headache. I had a stomach ache, and I said, I never want to feel this way ever again, so I don't drink. To this day, I don't. People will say, well, Gail, you know, wine's pretty good. <laughs> Champagne's very tasty. I mean, so th the point I'm making is I get high off of, the, off of my job. I get high when there's a breaking news story and we tell it well, or I get an interview that I've been trying to get or get an interview that everybody's trying to get right now. I really, really, really praying to sweet black baby Jesus. I want Brittany Griner. Um, who's here in Phoenix, as you know. Um, so I get high off of those kind of things. I love that. Go ahead, Valeria. Well, that's amazing. So, can you give us, a, you know, a little bit back, a little bit about background about you? When did you want to become a journalist? You know, I majored in psychology, so I didn't have a Wal Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. Um, I went to University of Maryland, and they do have a School of Journalism there. But my interest was in psychology, because um, I always thought that I'd be good at that. I, or I thought I'd be good as a lawyer arguing my case in front of, um, in front of a jury. And I got a part-time job at a TV station, and at that TV station, uh, CBS station, actually. And on the day that I went to work there, there was breaking news. And everybody was running all around, and they were trying to get the news on the air. And I had seen these people that I was watching on television. And then you meet them in person, you go, they're just regular people. And I was, fa hey, they're regular people. I was fascinated by that. And I was fascinated by getting the story on the air. And that's, that's when I got hooked. That's what happened to me. I walked in there, and I said, oh my god, I want to do this. Yeah, and I want to do this. And everything else is history. Yes, yes. <laughs> everything else is history. It's true. Um, I want to open it up to the audience, so if you guys want to come up and ask a question. Are you guys all journalism students? You are? Okay. Well, you we, must we'll have, have the microphone be brought up here real quick. And then um, be thinking of your questions, um, and we'll give you guys a little bit of time to come up to the microphone, but be thinking because after this question we'll have you come up. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how you maintain your level of objectivity and why is it important to be objective? Well, you know, I'll only speak for what happens at CBS. People don't uh, really want to hear my opinion. 
that really isn't the house that Walter Cronkite built, to be honest with you. It's really giving you the facts and letting you, the audience, draw your own conclusions. You know, it, it's not a cable station, and we really pride ourselves on giving you the facts, checking and rechecking uh, to make sure that we're presenting the facts so that viewers can make their own decisions about what they're seeing on television. So when you say, how do you, how do you keep your objectivity? Listen, I'm not a robot, <laughs> and I definitely have lots of opinions about lots of things, but that's not what I'm paid to do. And so I'm always very mindful of that. But everybody you see anchoring the news has an opinion about something. Everybody. But that's not the job that I'm paid to do at CBS. I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us. All right. S um, students, you guys are welcome to make your Students. Way up. Students or audience. You, anyone what what that is your is name, it? student? My, my name's student. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my name's Connor McGill. I'm Connor. a senior. Oh. Uh, my question, Gail, is you've obviously been in the journalism field for a long time. Yes. An industry that presents a lot of demand for journalists, both by telling hard news and the news that's good for the soul. How do you keep yourself afloat? I know. How do I keep myself what? A flow. I know, Connor. It's so, especially now when there's so much bad stuff. We had, we had a recent story where it was just one after the other after the other. And I just said, listen, I'm very mindful that this is just a really bad, crappy day for all of us. But I, I figured that, you know, I'm able to compartmentalize that because if you take it home, it'll drive you crazy. But there are some days that it just seems overwhelming, where the stuff doesn't make sense. You know that, that story in Idaho with the four college students who were killed, and they were trying to figure out who that was. That was very frightening to me. Or you, you, you look at uh, tragedies that happen to really good people, and there's no rhyme or reason for it. And so there are days that it does get to you, but you know, I feel that you just, it's not a matter of, um, Moving on, it's a matter of moving forward, and that's what I do. That's what I do. Thank, Thank you, Connor. Hi, Gail. My name is Blake, and Blake. my question for you is, what does it take to be a successful anchor, and what are the keys to delivering a successful broadcast? I think uh, it, what it takes is to be... I, I don't feel you can ever over-prepare, so I'm always very prepared. Uh, if someone's coming on and they've written a book, I've read the book. If there's a movie coming on, I've, I've watched the movie or the TV show. So I, I pride myself on being very prepared. And listen, at CBS, our, our, our staff is so good that producers read everything, and they give you copious notes, and they flag different things. But when I read the book, Blake, I'm always looking for that nugget, and I call them nugget. I'm looking for that nugget that isn't so obvious. So I, I wish I could remember who I was talking to, but he was talking about the birth of his child, and he said, and we were listening to Bruce Springsteen. I love Bruce Springsteen, too. I groveled for him for five years to get an interview with him, like, baby, 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 please, please, please. <laughs> I'm not above groveling. I'm not above groveling um, for an interview. But when I said to him, um, what, was, what song were you listening to? Because I was just curious. He goes, oh my god, you must have read the book. I go, yes, I read the book. And people are so flattered that you took the time to read the book. And I said, well, I'm flattered that you came. We're giving you a platform to tell your story. And I just wanted you, know, I wanted you to know we're very glad you're here. So for me, it's preparing, preparing, preparing. I don't think you can do enough of that. And also, don't be afraid of hard work. Because this job, when you're starting out, and it's, it, some days it's hard for me still. It is a lot of hard work, but I think the payoff is so rewarding that it doesn't even, that it gives me such joy, even still, even on my tiredest day. When our studio is in Times Square, and when I'm driving to work, well, actually, someone's driving me to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sitting behind the wheel of a car. Somebody's driving. When Steve is driving me to work, and it's uh, 4.45, 5 o'clock in the morning, we're in Times Square, and you, you see lights, camera, action of the billboards. And I go, look where we get to work. Look what we get to do. So I walk into the building every day. I'm energized. And it's a brand new day. Let's go. Let's get it right again. Thank That's how much. I feel. You know, what I like about you guys is that I hope you still, those of you who are starting out, that you, that you have the enthusiasm that I have as I sit here all these years in. I got my first on-air job when I was... 22, 23 in Kansas City. And I now sit here at 68, so I've been on the air a very long time. But I still really love this. And I hope 
that if you get into this business, and there are so many jobs in this business, not just on air, so many jobs. If I, did, if I could pick another job, I would probably want to be a director. But I hope that you still have the enthusiasm that I have for whatever you decide to do. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Renee Romo. Um, Hi, Re I, Renee Rumble? Romo. Oh, Romo. Renee yes. Romo. That's cool. Um, you are like one of my biggest inspirations. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's great thanks. to meet you. Thank you. Um, but I know you were saying that you know you are paid to be objective. You're not paid to share yes. your opinion. But what is your opinion on including opinions in journalism, I guess? I just don't think it's what we're supposed to do on broadcast news. I think if it's cable, you're on a cable show, and that's what you're paid to, you know, that's all opinion. That's great. But on broadcast news, I, I think people really just want to hear the news. But as again, I say, I'm not a robot, and occasionally, you know, I will say something, and sometimes it gets me into trouble, but, but, but I also know that I'm a human being too. I'm a, a proud American, I, you know, I'm a voter, I've never been arrested, I have opinions about everything, and sometimes the stuff just gets to you when you just see that it's just the, the system or the situation I, is very painful to me sometimes. But I don't think that that's what you're supposed to do on broadcast television. That's how I was raised, that's the, um, certainly the, what Walter Cronkite stood for, I couldn't even tell you if he was a Democrat or Republican or what, where he stood on, on issues. I, I honestly still don't know. I just know when there were pivotal moments, he was there and we could trust what he was saying. Thank you. Thank you, Renee Romo. That's Roma, that's a pretty name. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kayla Shipman. Restore. Nice to meet you. What's, I love what's your boots? <laughs> okay, what's your name? Kayla. Kayla. This is the thing. When I was coming today, I had these red booties but I also had some very cool silver tennis shoes that were sparkly. And I thought, I just think the students would like my tennis shoes so much better. <laughs> I think they're cool, they're platform, I wear them all the time, and yet, and they're hip, and I'm so not hip, I'm a big square. <laughs> but, but tennis shoes are having a moment, so I have all these sparkly, glittery tennis shoes, I like those. Because now you can wear tennis shoes with a gown, you can wear them with jeans, you can dress them up. And my hair and makeup team said, you can't wear that, Gail. That's not professional. And I go, why am I bowing to peer pressure <laughs> at 68? So I took off my shoes and changed. I said, is this better? Because I also hate when, when it doesn't go all the way down. Um, and they said, no, this, you're going to Arizona. You're going to the Walter Crockett School for Journalism. You should look more professional. So I changed. Don't you think I should have worn my sparkly tennis shoes? I would have loved to see them. they were silver, too. Yeah. They were silver and platform. They were, they were Prada. They were very cute. Yeah. But <laughs> what is your question? Actually, it kind of goes along the lines of that a little bit, but it's mostly about your personal brand. I think everyone in the room can say that, that we know you for being you and like standing out so well as yourself. Uh -huh. and there's so many people that are in the journalism space, and they're all doing the same, like, well, hello, welcome to, yeah. you know, whatever. And I think you're really good at being able to kind of be yourself in those roles, and that's why people remember you. So do you have any advice as far as, like, developing a personal brand but still I working know. for you a know network? What? The thing that drives me crazy is brand, where people say, what's your brand? I meet so many 20-somethings, no offense to anyone in the room, <laughs> that says I'm working on my brand, I have to have a brand. As I sit here to you today, I, honest to God, don't feel I have a brand. What I feel is somebody who works hard, wants to do a good job, and wants to be a success. So I never think of what's good for my brand, or should I do this, or it won't look good for the brand. You know, I have my own you know, personal integrity and credibility that I care about. I never want to do anything that would embarrass my favorite son or favorite daughter. I'm very mindful of that. Um, you know, I, I was asked, to, I've been asked to do Dancing with the Stars four times. And they're both like, oh God, mom, please, please don't do that. That would be so embarrassing. I go, you don't think that would be kind of fun? I don't want to do it. I don't, no, no, I, I don't want to do it. so cool. But you, you think that would be cool? I think no. it'd be so cool. No, no, no. I try to keep my public humiliation to a minimum. But, but when I hear brands, I just think, you know what your brand should be? Work hard and do a good job. That's, that's the only kind of brand I want, I want. But I see many young people who want it and want it now, and they think that there's an easy way to get there. And they're honest to God, guys, really isn't. There really isn't. Um, 
in, in terms of, like, I, 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 I notice what both of you have on today. I think you both look so good. I think you, you could sit on camera right now. Yeah. I couldn't decide what dress to wear, what color, so then wear them all. I love color, I love color. <laughs> I very seldom wear black on the air unless there's something very heavy in the news or something that's going on, but I don't work on a brand per se, I don't. Okay, I, I still you. don't. No, that's very helpful, thank yes, you very much. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir. Hi, Gail, Hi. my name is Jay. Uh, thank you for Jay? being here with us today. Um, happy Black History Month. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, we all have this drive or idea of success that we all envision here at Cronkite especially. I think most of us in the room are workaholics, if I'm being honest. But having interviewed so many successful people at their highs and at their lows, what are three elements of success that you feel are consistent? Uh, to me, it still goes back to hard work and being prepared and not being afraid to take chances. You know, so many things that we think are good ideas now, most people started thinking it's a bad idea. Like for instance, when you first heard about Airbnb, I saw these guys when they made the presentation. You know, we're gonna get a tree house and you know, we have a, um, uh, I remember a tree house, we have a tent and we have people's homes. I go, so wait a minute, you're going to go into people's homes. People are going to pay to go into people's homes who they don't know and stay there. And they said yes. And that just sounded like the craziest thing I've ever heard. But I mean, Airbnb is doing, in some cases, better than the hotel industry. The other one is Uber and Lyft. So wait a minute. People are going to come pick me up in their own car, and I'm going to get in the car with a stranger, and they said, but you get in cars now when you take a cab, which is true. You get, I don't know the name of the cab driver. You get in you, when you take a cab. And they're going to drive me around in their own car. So my point is sometimes crazy ideas turn out to be really uh, one of the best inventions. So I, I'd say my main thing is about working hard and don't be afraid. And always bet on yourself and put yourself, you know, some people say, I don't believe in luck. Um, I think sometimes you get a lucky break, but uh, bigger than that, I think luck is preparation meeting opportunity. So when the opportunity presents itself, you are ready. You are ready to go, Jay. Ready, ready, whatever it is, you're ready. Thank you, Gil. So I pride myself on staying ready. Even now, even now, I still think that there's something that I can learn and something that I can be better at something, even now. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Ms. King. Hi. I'm a huge fan. It's an honor to talk to you. My name is Brianna Chappie. Is um, Rihanna? Brianna. Oh, Brianna. Um, mm -hmm. You are a pioneer of women in the journalism industry, and I was wondering... Pioneer you... sounds so old, Brianna. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think Barbara Walters was a pioneer. When, when we lost Barbara Walters, I, 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 honest to God, do not think of myself as a pioneer. I think she was a pioneer. And I think of all the stuff she... And I knew her, actually. And I'm so sorry I never even talked to her about this. Like, what did you have to go through to get where you are today? Where you're working at an anchor desk where the men don't want you there. They try to trivialize, trivialize, trivialize what you do. They don't think you're worthy. And yet she still sat and still stood tall and, and made it her own. So I, I look at somebody like Barbara Walters, who certainly paved the way for all, all of us who are sitting up here today. Barbara Walters and, and a few others did that, but mainly Barbara Walters. So I'm just sort of um, following in her stead, if you will. I love that. And that like follows up into my question. Since you started as an anchor in the 80s, how would you say that the industry has changed for the better for women? And what is your biggest piece of advice that you would give young girls that are like following in your footsteps? In well, it, it's changed for women, but we're still dominant. It's still a business dominated by white men, still, still. But I also think that um, all, all news organizations are making an effort to change that. You're seeing more women in senior management positions. You're seeing more women directors. When I was coming up, there was only one, Olivia, and I was like, wow. That's why I thought if I could do it, I would love to be a director. You didn't see women, you didn't even see really women camera operators. You didn't really see that. Now you see women doing all the jobs in TV news. So it's changing, but we're still not the dominant force. We're still not, we may never be. But I, I do think that, you know, this is funny, even at um, CBS, 2012, my ID card, I couldn't believe it, my favorite son caught it, I didn't even catch it. 
on the back of the ID card at CBS in 2012 when I got it said, um, the person who, I, I wish I would have saved it and taken a picture. The, the person, uh, the identity of this card is he or, he or him uh, has access to all of this so and so and so. And Will said, Mom, have you ever looked at the back of your ID card? It says he or him will be allowed to blah, 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 blah. I know, in 2012. <laughs> so I took it and I said, guys, are you aware that our card says he or him? But, you know, it's one of those things, be honest, no one had paid attention to. It had just been like that for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And it takes people speaking up and bringing it to people's attention. I'm from the, if you, when you know better, you do better school. In all things in life, in all things in life, when you know better, you do better. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hi, Gail, I'm Hi. Cameron, and Hi, I was Cameron. curious about where you get your news. Like, what do you, besides show notes for CBS Mornings, what do you usually read first thing in the newspaper. morning? Newspaper. I love the newspaper. Um, I have about three or four that I like to read. Um, also, you know, you can get anything on your phone these days. But, you know, when I go into CBS, we have a meeting as soon as we get there about what's going to be in the show. We would have just had an, a meeting right before, the night before. I always have homework every single night. I have homework every night um, about what's in the show, who's in the show, what stories that we're covering. So I feel I'm a big reader. I lived in Turkey as a kid where there wasn't television. And we used to go to these places called libraries. <laughs> and we had these things called library cards and it had your name on it, and you would check out a bunch of books. And so I've always been a big reader, and I'm still a very big reader. So definitely a newspaper isn't going online, and of course, you know, I have all the resources at CBS. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron, thank you. Hi, Gail, how are you? Hi. Um, well, you didn't say what your name is? Uh, my name's Landon, nice to meet you. Landon and I have already had an encounter. <laughs> Landon and I have already taken a picture together. <laughs> And when we took our picture, I said, Landon, I don't like how you're smiling in this picture. You look like you, didn't I say this to you? I said, yes. you look like you're grimacing. Cause he was like, I said, Landon, you look like you're grimacing or in pain. So let's do this again. And next time we take the picture, Landon, um, say yay. Cause when you say yay, when you take a picture, it gives your mouth a natural smile. It's so much better than cheese. So note to self next time, just go, yay. Now it feels goofy. It feels goofy when you're doing it. But I guarantee you it looks really good in the picture. Landon, what's your question? Um, my question. Landon, my new best friend. Yes, sir. Thank you, Gail. Um, my question is, um, you've interviewed R. Kelly, yes. President Obama, and countless other um, no notable people in the world. Yes. What is one person you would uh, love to interview, dead or alive? Mm, I always thought Jackie Onassis. You guys know Jackie Onassis, right? Mm -hmm. She was married to John F. Kennedy, um, and she never, never did an interview. Um, I, I would always be curious because I admired President Kennedy so much. You know, when we lived in Turkey, I lived in Turkey from first grade to sixth grade, and he was assassinated in 1963, so I was there from 60 to 66. It was the first time I ever saw my dad cry. And when you're a little kid and you see your dad cry, that's very jarring, very jarring to you. And we didn't have a television, and we we're all gathered around the radio listening to the news. And he was talking about it. And I, then, you know, I started reading about him and his family and his wife, Jacqueline. I just thought, I really would have liked to have talked to her about living through that, dealing with that. She had two little kids. I, I always would have liked to interview her when you say, Dad. I, 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 I just would want to do that. But she would never talk. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Landon. <laughs> Hi, Miss King. Hi. I'm Max Apeda. I'm a freshman here. And I just wanted to ask you, um, I've, I was homeschooled for the large majority of my childhood. And I obviously did not have the worry of having to go to school without having to watch you or anything because I didn't have a school bus to catch or whatever. Yeah. So, um, but I realized that as I was getting older, the mediums of how we were getting our news in the morning especially were completely changing from Facebook and Twitter and yeah. email newsletters and everything like that. So what would you say that you guys at CBS are at least doing to, especially since you've been there since 2011, since I think I started watching morning news, 
how have you guys been able to adapt to the times and what well, advice could you give to people who are trying to adapt to the times right now? This is such a good question, Max, because you, you really do have to meet people where they are. And so for us, we have a whole streaming system. We have a whole uh, social with TikTok. TikTok is huge. I know, TikTok is huge. <laughs> yeah. uh, TikTok is huge, Instagram, Facebook. You, we've had to pivot so that we can meet viewers like you. Because most guys your age aren't even watching morning news, right? Unless it's CBS Mornings. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but most of you really are not watching the news. So we have to figure out a way to reach the audience where they are. And I do think that everybody's trying to learn how to do that better, all of us. We just did, um, I don't know, they had this game called the Super Bowl, and it, and it was in Phoenix, and it was Kansas City, and the Eagles fly, Eagles fly, or Kansas City Chiefs, and the score was 35 to 38. And who can remember who the halftime performer was? Rihanna. There you go. I know, she was so good. <laughs> Were you watching it the way I was watching it, going, is she pregnant? I, I rewound my thing, like, is, is that her belly, or is that the coat, or what is that? I mean, I, I couldn't believe it, and then I got so excited. I've been trying to get Rihanna, too, for eight years, and still haven't cracked that nut. And I actually know her, and so I'm gonna, but, but during Rihanna's performance online, there was a, 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 deaf, a, a deaf nursing student who was signing for her. Did you guys see her? Yes, yeah. Justina Miles is her name. I thought she was so fantastic. Yes, I just interviewed her. And how did I get that interview? Got her phone number, sent her a check. Number one, it was just so fun to watch her. I, I wish, it made me wish, God, I wish I could sign. But the way she went, bap, 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 I mean, just every, <laughs> everything she did was so, I just fell in love with her. And I sent her a text and I said, hi, it's Gail King from CBS Morning. Um, you know, I watched you, blah, 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 would you come on our show? And her response was, OMG, capital exclamation point. That's normally a good sign when people start with that. <laughs> anyway, she came on, and my, the point I'm making is, most people saw that interview with her online, on TikTok, right. um, and on our social media. They didn't actually see the actual interview, so when you say, what are you guys doing? That's what we're doing. We're putting those type of interviews up, so that it, it at least, um, lets people know there is a CBS Mornings. Yeah. For those that aren't as intelligent and smart as people in this class, <laughs> lets you know that we're at least out there. So that's what we're doing. Thank you, Miss Kay. Thank you, thank you, Max. Yes. Hello. Hello. My name's Lula. Lula. Yes. Is that the name on your birth certificate? Yeah. Wow, Lula. It's not even short for anything either. I know. That's. What, I, I figured it was like Louise or yeah. Lillian. Lula. My nickname's just Lou. What, what's so. your middle name? Oh, it's Kamiko. Lula Kamiko? Yeah. Wow. Thanks. All right, Lula. <laughs> uh, my question. But, but don't you like your name? Oh, I do like yes. it. Yes. Yeah. I li more my first name. Middle name's kind of weird. It's no. fine. L Lula's nice. <laughs> but, yes, um, Lula. My question for you is, you say how you got a degree in psychology. How do you think those skills helped you get to where you are today? And if you mm. could go back in time, what skills do you wish you could have learned before entering the working world? Well, I, th I think, well, if I knew I was going to do this, I would have concentrated more on journalism. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really think my psychology degree has helped me in terms of this business. I actually don't think that. I, I think what has helped me is uh, getting an entry-level position and, and, and doing the work. So I don't necessarily think that helped me. But I do think going to college is important in terms of your socialization, I think responsibility, learning to play nicely with others, learning to take your own personal responsibility for getting yourself to class, setting up your study habits, doing well in class, making good choices while you're in college. I think, I think the college experience is so important, whether you, regardless of whether you use your particular degree in your chosen field. Or you could get to the point where you get the degree and decide, I don't really want to do this. I thought I did, but I don't. But you have the right to change your mind but at least nobody can take away your education from you, nobody. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily think that's what, that, that's what has helped me. Mm -hmm. If I had to do it all over, I would concentrate more on taking classes that would have helped me be a better writer. I would have done that. I can so remember when I was in Turkey, um, in, in elementary school, because I was such a good reader, uh, I was taking an English class and I had written a story about a soldier who had come home from the war and I used the word, and he was bedraggled. And I remember 
my teacher um, did exclamation point, exclamation point, great word, great word, you're going to be a good writer. And I wish I would have concentrated on it. I only knew that from reading. I got that word from reading. Because it wasn't certainly something I'd heard before. But because I was a big reader, I, I, learned, I, I knew a lot of stuff. I knew a lot of words. Mm -hmm. And I wish if I had to do it over, I would have taken more classes that would, I think would have made me a better writer than I am today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lula. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Sophia Braccio. And Hello, Sophia. you've built such an amazing career. Is there a piece of best advice you've gotten from a colleague or mentor? And is there a piece of worst advice that you heard and said, I will not follow I, that? I will never do that. Mm. Worst advice. I don't know. I don't remember worst advice. I'm sure I've had some, but I don't remember that. Um, I tend not to maintain or retain the negative in my life. That's good. Uh, I do. I, you know. Well, I do. I try to. I try to stay positive for most of the time. But sometimes being too positive, I don't think that's good either. I, I, I have a thing where you're so used to when people say, "How are you? Go fine." Even you could be having the shittiest day, you go fine, just because it's just easier. So I, I don't necessarily think that's good either. Um, because everybody goes through phases where you need help with something, and it should be okay to ask for help without feeling lesser than or judged. But my best advice is, I, I am a very optimistic person in most situations. It takes a lot to get me angry. It takes a lot to get me down. But when I do lose my temper, people pay attention because it's sort of a rarity. So if I do lose my temper, um, I happen to think it's a very good reason. <laughs> but I, I just, I, it, to me, it all boils down again to doing whatever it takes. Set your sights on something and say, what do I need to do to get there? I'm a very... Um, solution-oriented person. I don't tend to, woe is me if things go wrong. I'm instantly thinking, OK, what do we need to do to fix it? What do we need to do to fix it? What do we need to do to make it right? Um, I got this lesson very early from Maya Angelou. Do you all know Maya Angelou in this class? I know you do. Um, and I was um, complaining to Maya about something that was going on at work. I said, and Maya, and then, and then, and then they said, and then they did, and, and she said, stop it. And I go, stop it, stop it, and just say thank you. Well, why am I saying thank you? <laughs> um, she said, because whining is so unbecoming, it lets them know there's a victim in the neighborhood. Isn't that good? Whining is so unbecoming, it lets them know there's a victim in the neighborhood. That's really good advice. Mm -hmm. So when she said that to me, I realized, A, people don't want to hear your problems. <laughs> they don't want to hear you whine. So I, I'm, I've always been a very solution-oriented person. What can I do to fix it? Now, we all have days where it's just overwhelming, like, how the hell am I? What can I do? We all have days like that. But just generally speaking, whining, I think Maya's right, is very unbecoming and lets them know there's a victim in the neighborhood. That's really good advice. Her other is, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time, true. Really good in dating. You're work, if you're with some guy and you think he's a jerk early on, he doesn't, he doesn't stop being a jerk. Please remember that. Number two, she said, people may not, um, people, may forget what you said, they may forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And that's so true. That's so true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last question, OK. Last question. Hello, Ms. King. Uh, my oh, name is. Did you want to come oh. up? Sorry. Did you want to come up? Come. I didn't oh. see anybody behind you. Come up. No, no, no. You have the no, chance no. to ask no. Gail King a question. Get up no. here, girlfriend. Get up here. Now we have, what Get is up your here. name? Yes. Audrey? OK. Audrey. 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 Come on, Audrey. OK, go ahead. OK, beautiful. <laughs> we got Audrey up here. OK, so my. <laughs> Audrey, feel no pressure. I'm okay. so excited for you, girl. What's your name? Um, Leah. Leah, OK. Yes. So my question, I guess, 
for lack of better words, you are famous. And even if that wasn't the end goal. No, it wasn't. Um, absolutely. For most wasn't. people, I feel like it is, isn't right? Like, it kind of just it, it feels like that now. It yeah. feels like people are trying to do something on TikTok or something online just to get attention, just to get clicks, yep. just to be noticed. And, and that just makes me sad. That yeah. just makes me sad. Yep. So and I love everything you said. Goal, it wasn't my goal to Leah be famous or for people to know my name. It wasn't. Right. I'm not saying that's not fun. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm not saying that at all because it can be very fun. <laughs> um, but that was certainly not my goal. I just wanted to be good. Right. I and I love everything you've said about like hard work and yeah. staying consistent. Um, I want to hear from you. What was your aha moment? Like, when were you like, I have made it? Made like, it. You, you got where you wanted to be. Um, I actually felt pretty good after I got my first job. Yeah. I mean, I knew I wasn't, you know, a big deal. I knew that. But I was so proud of myself for getting my first job. And I just thought, now I'm on my way to something. Right. Now I'm on my way to something. And it starts, you know, baby steps. You know, I, I took out the, I was in a reporter training program and I, when it was time, you know, they said, we're going to get you a resume reel. I took out, back then they had a thing called the broadcast cable book and it showed you all of the TV markets in the country. There were 212. New York was number one. Uh, Chicago was number two. LA was number three, or maybe it was vice versa. But Chicago, New York, LA were the top three. So I knew I wasn't going to get in the top three. I knew that. I'm just starting out. But I did think... I didn't have to be in the 100s or 200s. I actually even thought, I don't even have to be in the 50s. Let me try for 30, between 20 and 40. That was my thinking. Let me try that. And so I took out the uh, broadcast cable book, and I looked at all of the uh, markets between there. And then I said, I want to go to a city that has a sports team, because sports gives ci a, a city energy. Um, even if you don't like sports, it gives a city energy. So I said, whether it's college sports or professional sports, then I thought, okay, my mom was in Chevy Chase, was in Maryland, so I don't really want to go too far away from my mom. I'd like to sort of be in the Midwest or the East Coast. And I narrowed it down to Kansas City. Then, after I got a list of things, I would call the news station and introduce myself and ask to speak to the assistant of the news director. Because... Never play assistant small because they know every damn thing. <laughs> and you don't want to make an enemy of somebody's assistant. Note to self. Noted. So I would call the assistant and I'd introduce myself. Hi, my name is Gail King. Um, I'm applying, I'd like to apply for a job at your station. I just wondered, do you have any openings? You know, I'm a young woman of color. Do you have any openings? And, you know, no one can say, no, you can't apply. But I said, I just want to know do you think I have a shot? And some people would say, well, we, are, we don't have any openings here. And I said, and some people would say, well, sure, send in your tape and send it to me. And I would get his or her name and send it to them. And that way, you know, I at least knew somebody would look at it. I, I just wanted to make a personal connection that somebody would look at it. And I got my first job in Kansas City, which was in the 26th market, mm -hmm. and had three different sports teams. They had the Chiefs, they had football, they had basketball, and they had baseball. And I just dove in headfirst and stayed there. Love it. I was always a very resourceful kid. When I was pregnant with my first child, and I was trying to find a good doctor, I called around to the different doctor's offices in the hospital, and I pretended that I was a nurse who had moved in from San Francisco. And I said, you know, I'm calling you nurse to nurse because I know, as a nurse, we know all the good doctors. So I'm pregnant, and who do you all think is a good OBGYN? I just introduced myself on the phone. It was a bit of a stretch because I was not a nurse. <laughs> And, and these names, these names kept coming back. I picked the names that kept coming back, and I went to one of those doctors. Genius. I All thought right. so too, Leah. That's smart. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was very proud of myself. <laughs> Hello, Audrey. <Hi. laughs> I'm Audrey. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. Um, no, you're not. <laughs> but I just you're in safe hands. To... Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to ask if you have any advice for women looking to go into journalism, or just advice in general. Um, I, I think, first, please know that there are many different jobs that you can do. You know, it's not just on air, whether it's a producer, whether it's an editor, whether it's a director, 
whether it's a writer. There are so many different jobs you can do. And I think you have to make a point of studying what those jobs are, figure out where your skill set is, and figure out a way to get an entry level position. I, I can't tell you guys how blown away I am by the facilities that you have here. How you could do a resume reel, you could set yourself up right here um, to go out into the world. And Audrey, you just have to go for it. You have to decide. Do you even know what you want to do? And it's okay not to know at this point what you want to do. That's also okay. Yeah. So you, yeah, you get to try different stuff. Do you know what you want to do? Um, I really want to go into producing or something with sports. Um, with sports, good. I good. Really. Enjoy do you like everything. sports? Yeah. You do. Yeah. All kinds. All kinds. All kinds. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I can't say that it's a woman-heavy business which I think makes it all the more appealing, I think. Mm -hmm. You just got to know your stuff, Audrey. You got to know your stuff when you go. You got to know your stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. I just texted and, and her Audrey, mother. Audrey, and I was like, when you, you wait, I want to say something to Audrey for a second. Because, Audrey, when you were coming up and I said last question, then you turned around. Don't turn around. Just keep walking right up to the microphone. I always say, walk with purpose. Walk with purpose. And when someone said, like, I didn't have a ticket to something over the weekend, and I just said, I'm going to walk with purpose, <laughs> and just, just put out my, my, my thing and showed my bag, and, and like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going on over there. <laughs> walk with purpose. Audrey, thank you. Thank you for thank your so question. Much. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Audrey, text your mom. She's very happy for you right now. <laughs> I texted her mom. I was like, Gail King's chanting your daughter's name. <laughs> Um, this one is a little Audrey? bit, yeah, she's my roommate. She's oh. my best friend. I love her dearly. <laughs> Guys, I'm Audrey's roommate. You're Audrey's roommate. And what is your name? Audrey? My name is Emily. Emily. Okay. Yes. Um, this is, is last Audrey question. Is Audrey neat or is she a little messy? Oh my God. She's so neat and she, she keeps me so sane. She's Audrey, the best. Audrey, I wish you were my roommate because I'm very messy. <laughs> That's she's what my I'm bestie. working on for myself. I'm so freaking messy. I got to figure that out. No, she's the best. She keeps me sane. All right, Emily. This last question is a little bit more personal. Uh-huh. Um, when I'm available. <laughs> you have a nice guy for me? <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, when you're going through a time, a hard time, where you feel so burnt out or overwhelmed or, you know, where you feel sort of lost in the work, where I think all of us get to a point where we're like, wow, is this, you know, really what I want to be doing? Do. Um, what have you done to cope? Do you keep pushing? Do you take a step back? Because I then, think a lot of us are there. Break. You know, there are some times when I'm going, 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 and as much as I love my job, sometimes it can be very exhausting where I'll fly to California, take a red eye back, land, and go straight to work. I've done that on a couple of occasions, depending on how things worked out, and sometimes you just get friggin' tired. And then you do have to, I'm not saying work yourself to the bone that you're tired, but sometimes we all have those times and I just take a break, where I, I have a weekend where I don't even get dressed. I do bathe, but I don't get dressed. And it's so nice not to put on makeup, not to get dressed, to eat what you want, to do what you want. Um, so sometimes we all just need a break. We all just need a break. I really just don't needed Gail King to say it was okay to take a break. Yeah. So thank you. I'll text my editor. It'll be great. <laughs> well, Audrey, I mean, listen. Emily, you have to time your breaks. Yeah. You know, it's of not course. Enough. Like, I am so fascinated by people coming in today and saying, you know, well, I need balance and I need to, uh, I can only work X amount of hours. I just don't think that's how it works in the real world. I think you have to work really hard. You have to pay your dues. You have to pay your dues. But I don't think you do it at the expense of your health. I don't believe that either. But you do have to pay your dues. And I think sometimes, People just think, well, you know, I need to have uh, balance in mental health. When I was starting out, I had no balance. And maybe, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm not saying that that's a good thing. We have to carve it out, but we also have to be mindful when you're starting out a job, you are needed on that job. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. You have the last question, sir. How are you doing today? I'm good today. My What's name your name? Nicholas Reese. What is it? Nicholas Reese. Hi, Nicholas Reese. I got a personal question for you. Okay. So, I know you have a lot of money. <laughs> and, uh, 
Depends on your definition of a lot of money, but go ahead. Well, I know you. I'm doing all right, Nicholas. I'm right, doing all right. Right, right, right. I'm doing all right. I know you've made some good money to support yourself and your family. I'm doing all right. So, yes. Like, how have you been able to balance uh, being able to create generational wealth for your family and keep? like maintain your job and like be a good person and just handle like balance it all out how do well i think you hire people to help you with that that's not something i can do right so i think i have a good team that does that i thought you were going to ask me how do you uh handle when because i do think about this when you raise children when you can give them basically everything they whatever want. they want um, how, I thought you were going to ask me, how do you handle that? And my thing is, you don't give them everything they want. When, when favorite daughter Kirby was three, um, and she first had the realization of Santa, I had the kids you know, give a list, and I bought everything on their list. And Kirby had 23 things on the list. And, but I was very excited about Santa, too, myself. And she opened the last one, and she goes, is that it? Now. It's not that she was being obnoxious. She was asking, is it over? And in that moment when she said that, it just gave me, gave me chills because I thought, this is not what the child I want to raise, that she gets 23 things and thinks, is that it? And she goes, oh, OK. But, and so I knew in that moment I would never again give them everything they wanted just because they wanted it. I, I raise them. I think it's important to save. I think it's important to work hard. I insisted they have jobs when they were 15 and 16 and that they, that they save their money, and that just because you can doesn't mean you get it. And for my own life, you know, I, I, I try to make smart investments and rely on the people to give me good financial advice. Great. Is that all right, Nicholas? That's amazing. OK. <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to disappoint you. No, OK, you Nicholas it. Reese, all right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That is. <laughs> Um, all the time we have for the questions today. So I first want to thank the audience for asking questions. Yes, thank you and guys. Thank you. Thank you. And, <laughs> but most importantly, I want to thank our 39th Walter oh. Cronkite Award of Excellence in Journalism. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Thirty-nine may now be my favorite number. Before, my favorite number was three for me, Kirby, and Will. I got divorced when, when, when they were four and five. So we, I used to think of us as a tripod. Their dad was very involved in their lives. He's a good dad, shitty husband. But I think it's important. <laughs> I think it's important that you have that they have a relationship with their dad. So three was my favorite number. And then Kirby got married. And then you know I really like I really love her husband. And now she's given me a grandchild. So my new favorite number had moved up to five from three, but now it might have to be 39. Yeah. Thank That's you, guys. Thank you, thank you. She's amazing. We love her fun, optimism. Thank you. Are thank you guys you. coming to the lunch tomorrow? Yeah. Are you coming? Oh, I hope you'll come, because I'm going to go back. Well, we have a dinner tonight with Dean, with the Dean, and some of the hot ahas and the hootie hoos and lottie dahs of the school. So I have a dinner with them tonight. I'm going to go back and still put some finishing touches on my speech, and then I'll be ready for that lunch tomorrow. I hope to see you there. Bye. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job.